I talked for a minute tonight uh, before we got started, and um, we came up with a few topics that we thought might be just fun to discuss. And we're also going to be covering some new things tonight as well. So, Wendy, I think um, what I'd like to jump in with, and I'll let you take the lead on this initially, is I think there's a lot of women out there that are frustrated because they have the idea that there's a lot of non-committal men out there. Okay, so that's perception. First of all, I want to get your take on this. Is that perception or is it a reality? And then if it's, yeah. if it's a reality, what are some of the good reasons on why it takes men longer to commit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a different point of view more than it is anything else. We actually just are seeing dating and courtship and commitment in two very different ways. And so I want to talk about how men see it versus how women see it. Because one of the very first and most frustrating things that we see in dating is, we, if, especially if we go online, is we see, oh, those men, they're just all out for fun. They're talking about fun in their profile. They're keeping it short. They're keeping it light. He doesn't talk about wanting a partner or a wife. And I present with the whole partner package so he knows what I'm really up to. And what's really going on there is there's just two very different mismatches in dating styles. And ladies, I think the men have it right. So what men do that is so different than us is they don't present with the whole partner package up front and what a great husband and provider and all the rest that they would be. They talk about fun because they understand that all their job is is to get in front of you and find out in anywhere from 10 minutes to a couple hours if he's attracted, if you're interesting, if you're interested, and if there's a vibe. And so they are understanding that dating is one baby step at a time. First, let's get her out to coffee or a drink and find out if we even like each other. Because usually, and as you know, if you've done any dating at all, it can be over in two seconds. No chemistry. None. Mm -hmm. So the very first step is, do I like this person? Where we will carry out every bit of how wonderful we are as a partner and our huge laundry list of everything he must be in a partner. And it's like leading with the end game in mind. It's like talking about a prenup on a first date. It's just too soon. It's too soon to start talking about the million ways that you are nurturing and how you're dying to sit in front of the fireplace with him and hold his hand and carry on into the sunset when you don't even know his middle name. Yeah, I think this is so true, and I'm really glad you uh, shared that. I also think there's a couple other things maybe we can add to this, and that is that I think good men, and when I say good men, I mean men that are dealing with you in good faith and who are you know, sincere in whatever it is they're doing in terms of dating. Um, they're honestly exploring. Um, I, I think that most of those men are aware that if they become your boyfriend, or they become your partner, or they become your husband, that there are certain obligations or agreements that they're entering into, in so making that commitment, in that, you know, taking the relationship to that next level. And I think these men that really do have integrity about this, they don't want to write checks that they're that are going to bounce. They don't want to write emotional checks or commitment checks that won't bounce. And so I think a lot of these men really think about these things and you know want to have that time to dance with you, to get to know you, to explore something before they make a commitment that they may not be able to keep. I just think that's really um, significant. I know, like with my own husband. You know, I felt like he kind of took his time in kind of getting to know me and kind of moving things to that next level. Sometimes it felt like a little bit like we were dragging to me. But I know now, and knowing him, that was because he was taking whatever commitment he was making to me very seriously. I mean, that was important to him, that he was all in, ready to go, before we moved things to kind of that next level. Do you have anything yeah. to add to that? 
Yeah, I do. And I think that all women can relate to this piece that we are very different when we are in our flow versus in, and going with the flow than when we're in our masculine mode, or we'll just call it our CEO mode. When you are have your CEO hat on or your director hat on and you're accountable, when you're accountable in the world, you're looking at what, okay, since I'm accountable for this, what am I committing to? How accountable, if I'm gonna sign up for this gig, this job, this volunteer thing, if I'm gonna be accountable, I need to look at all the accountabilities and make sure I'm 100% in, right? And that's what men are doing. Because masculine energy is accountability. And we can see that when we're in our own masculine. When we're in the flow, it's like, oh, this feels so good, let's go with it and we'll sort out the details later. Mm, CEO mode, masculine mode is going to make sure they're going to look at the accountability. What, what am I committing to? Do I have the capacity to? And do I want to with this person? Now, another thing that they're going to look at is they're going to commit to the whole person. Most men, not all men, but most men are going to commit to the whole person. So he's going to take longer to commit than we do because oftentimes we'll say yes. And then if we don't like something, we'll try and figure out how we're going to change it like the way he dresses or the way he chooses food or something, we'll say yes and we'll get hard at work to changing the thing or the things that we don't like, right? And mm -hmm. men don't usually do this. They're going to look at the whole package and think, can I commit to this? Can I commit to her? Can I commit to the fact that she laughs kind of loud? Can I commit <laughs> to the fact that she, ooh, she can be a little biting when she hasn't eaten? Can I, is that, can I do that? Can I, <laughs> can I navigate that? And instead of trying to change us. So they're looking at the whole package and once they do commit, they've committed to all of her, to all of us. Mm -hmm. it's a yeah, um, that is so true. And I think that is a distinct difference. And actually it's really important that you brought that out because I think it's really important for us as women to remember that the men that we meet, they are who they are, and we don't need to look at them as fixer-upper projects. So often for women, we look at men as kind of fixer-upper projects, and um, for good reason, most of them don't really like feeling like they're a fixer-upper project. They resent it. They don't like it. Oh. And it's really important that you remember it. You, what you see is what you get with a man. I mean, you don't want to go into something thinking that you're going to change him because it's going to be a frustration for you and it's not going to feel good to him. He's not going to like it. He's probably going to really push back. So one other thing about this before we move on is that in the Man Panel series, Mark Rosenfeld, who I interviewed, shared another idea around this which is that um, relationships are important to men. However, there is a difference typically in how many of us were brought up. And that was that for many women, like getting to that wedding day was like taught to us as the big highlight of our lives. You know, that was like the end all be all of our existence <laughs> for so many of us. That was like, you know, the Cinderella go off with the handsome prince kind of idea, whereas so many little boys were brought up with the idea of go out and explore the world, conquer the world, make your way in the world, have success in a career, et cetera, et cetera. Then maybe think about settling down, getting married, and that sort of thing. So there's a little bit of a, a difference in that respect too. And I think a lot of men feel like they need to be there. They need to have succeeded to a certain level in their careers and that sort of thing to kind of feel like they're worthy, ready, able to provide whatever it is they have been taught or think that they're supposed to provide, even with a woman that doesn't necessarily need that from an economic standpoint. Can I say, say something about that, about the research that I've done over the years? Yes, please. Okay, good. So I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men over 16 years on this very topic about commitment. And what I found, and I'm just going to generalize like crazy here, but what I found is that when they marry young, when they marry in their teens, early twenties, 
what they're marrying for is adventure. It's another fun adventure. Yay. It's a fun thing to do. Okay. And love, but adventure, like the driving force is adventure. When they marry in their twenties, thirties, when they're in the start and or middle of their career is they, and this is the bulk of men, right? That they actually want to build a life with a partner. And that makes sense to us, right? They want to build a life with a partner. They want someone sharing in the load and creating family and dynasty and all that good jazz, right? And then there are a smaller percentage of men that do it a different way. And it's very similar to what Michelle was just talking about. In fact, it is what Michelle was just talking about. But these men are very misunderstood. And how they approach it is, I am going to build my kingdom. And once it's built, once I've got some facility in my career, I got some money happening, or maybe I'm building and buying the house. Once I have built my kingdom, then I will go find my queen and move her in. And oftentimes, we women will look at that guy and go, he's 48, never been married, what a player. No, he's almost ready to wife hunt and, and have that happen. And so we'll pass by the 52 year old who's never been married because we're afraid that it, he is that way for a good reason. And I say investigate. I really want to um, have Wendy share something that I think is really interesting and really important. And um, this is something that Wendy has done a ton of research on. And this is on uh, the idea of can you be a man's type or, you know, a man's type and what goes on around that. And so Wendy has shared with me and maybe with some of you before a really funny story about this. So maybe, Wendy, you can start there and we can talk about this a little bit. The first date I had had after a long-term marriage and he, I was newly divorced, he was newly divorced. And his ex-wife was about 95 pounds and she had a short brown hair, pixie brown, brown eyes, Italian. And I was about, at the time, like 250 pounds, red hair, green eyes. Like we couldn't have been any different if we tried. I mean, the only way we could have been different was a different race, right? right. But he swears to this day, we're still friends all these years later. He swears we are the same type is that like us, they have many types, right? I could give you five or six men who would be my type and they don't look anything alike. Uh, and I'm sure you too, if you think of actors or, or famous people that are interesting to you, they probably aren't like maybe your husband or your boyfriend or the guys you've dated in the past. So they have different types, but also it is, it's hugely vast and it's in our essence. It's, it's in that moment when they're with you. So a man is standing in front of you and he's seeing you face to face. You are or you're not. Oh, what? Yes, it's such great news. You are or you're not. So one of the things that we always do is we, we get a date and we like the date and we hope he likes us and he asks us that again and we run home and we plan the second date and we try and become more attractive. And then we go buy products and new clothing and figure out what else to wear and what to look better in to be more attractive. You don't have to do that. <gasps> you are or you're not. I mean, don't show up, you know, in your sweats or anything, but put it together as best you can. But we don't have to work so hard anymore. We don't have to buy the shiny hair products and all the things and the pheromones with the perfume and the deal to have him be flipped to liking you more. They do or they don't. And one man I was interviewing, I said, so what's your type? And he said, well, I have many types, but I grew up, uh, the, my, I hit puberty in Florida right at the end of the hippie era. So long, straight hair, natural, flip-flop, hippie girl. And I said, what you doing with me? And he said, there's enough of her in you. Now, I don't see that, but he could see that. So we want to, like the eye, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so is attraction. And so is their type. So just because he says Cameron Diaz and you don't look like her, or just because he says hippie chick and you don't look like that, you don't get to judge. I still don't think I look anything like the teeny tiny Italian lady. <laughs> But we don't get to judge. It's right there for them. And it's 
all of the senses. It's our personality. It's the way we move. It's, we worry that it's the shape. You know, we'll look at his ex-girlfriend and go, oh, she's long, lean, and blonde, and I'm curvy, petite, brunette. So that's not going to work out. It's not like that for them at all. So you don't want to try and guess it, and you don't want to try and guess it by stereotyping. Because that's we have these archetypes of the buxom redhead or the curvaceous, you know, athletic brunette or the groovy Peruvian. or you know, We have these ideas of what type is, and it just isn't that. It's very personal. It's moment by moment. It's every single bit of our essence. And some men do have a preference of shape. But it's, uh, that's more rare. That is more the exception. And especially as men get older, that, that tends to go away. So when they're 20, when they're in their breeding years from a biological standpoint, hourglass figure, that, that indicates she's not pregnant, go hunt that. Right? <laughs> so from a biological standpoint, that makes sense. But when they're 40s, 50s, 60s, are you in here? Are you moving in here? Are, are you at home in your home? That's what they're looking for. The, the shape part doesn't matter as much. And if you're with a guy who says, I really like you, I think you're great, I like everything about you, but you know, you could lose a little and you could, you know, you could, he's not your guy. He's not mm -hmm. your guy. Mm -hmm. Because one thing I learned out of 121 first dates and decades of understanding type is you really want to be his. You really do. Because as you age and as you gain a little more or a lot more or lose a little more or a lot more, he still likes your body. And if you can live in a world where your man loves your body, how it is, aging and all, it's heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. So I want to leave you with that. Yeah, yeah, I really, I really, really appreciate this. I think this is such an important piece for women to understand. And thank you, Wendy, for doing all that research for five years to provide us with that. And I will say one thing that's really important is this can be different for women, meaning that a man usually knows like you said, right away, if you're his type, even if you don't think that you're his type based on who he was with in the past, if you know who he was with in the past. But for women, sometimes we can develop an attraction to men that we're not initially attracted to. And this is a big distinction. But I asked a couple of men, and I've asked men before on previous man panels about this, and they said that doesn't usually happen for men. No. Nope. Um, doesn't happen. Um, they're either attracted or they're not. And it's actually good news because we don't have to, uh, if we know we're not their type or we know we are their type, we don't have to continue to prove ourselves to be their type or we don't have to try to flip them. And I know you have something to say about flipping them, but we can touch on that in a minute. But for women, okay, yes, if you go out with a man and he makes your skin crawl on the first date, you're probably not going to develop attraction for him. If the two of you were the only people on a desert island and nothing was ever going to happen, he, you're probably not going to develop attraction to him. And so if you absolutely know that's not happening, you don't need to continue to explore that or go on other, other dates. However, if you sense, you know what, there, there could be maybe a little something about this guy or he doesn't necessarily flip your switch like, wow, when you first meet him, but he's really showing up in a nice way or there are things you like or appreciate about him, you may want to consider giving it the second or third date. Because in those kinds of cases, sometimes that attraction does develop. I know I've had clients, and I'm sure you've had clients, Wendy, that this has happened with, where initially they're not attracted at all, but they get to know this man and the way he's showing up, the way he makes her feel. She enjoys being with him. She finds that he's someone that maybe she admires and respects. And there's a lot to love about him. She starts to find him increasingly more attractive. But what we're telling you here is that's possible sometimes for women, not usually possible for men. Correct. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a nuance here, Wendy, and I want you to touch on this about flipping them because I know we've talked about this and it is possible to flip them, 
but tell us what goes on there. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. You can flip them, and I know I have flipped, I have flipped many of them. It's completely possible. I'm very tart-like. You must know this about me to, to know and love me to know I'm tart-like. <laughs> so I have flipped many a men, men who I was not their type, but I wanted them. I had to have them. You know that. You've had that experience where you had to have him. I had to have him. So I flipped him. And how you flip them, if you want to know the secret, is you just put out all that sexual energy. You know this. You've already had to do this yourself. You put out all this sexual energy, just woo, woo, and you flirt, and you put out all the sexiness juice you have, and you try and do everything, including whip out stories to be funny and and, and sucking it in and doing all the things. And if you pour a ton of sexual energy out, you might be able to flip them and then you can sleep with them. <laughs> <laughs> but you never feel beautiful or wanted or desired because you made it happen because you had to have them because your chemistry was so high that you did care. You just didn't care. And I know that not all women do that. Only, only my tart-like sisters and I do that. <laughs> but um, yeah, you can flip a guy to becoming, uh, you can flip a guy to want to have sex with you, but you're not going to flip him to become his type. And so he's, he'll, he'll be willing to have sex with you, but you're still not going to be his type. And it just doesn't feel very good. And if you ever had that experience of dating a lot of people and you look back at your history, you can tell by how you felt if you were his type or not. By you ever feel beautiful and wanted and desired or did you just have to keep working at it all the time, all the time, all the time. And it's exhausting. It's exhausting. And it's also, I think, a source of a lot of pain ultimately because you're going to feel insecure if you do gain those pounds you know, he may not be attracted to you no matter how much uh, sexual energy you're putting out there. And uh, it's, it's going to take a lot for you to try to keep up that over a period of time and probably not give you a very good chance of a relationship really going the distance because one or the other of you is going to become disenchanted with the whole experience. And so really not a good idea. Really not a good idea. If you're wanting a long-term committed relationship, it's not going to work. And yeah, you want someone that's going to love you and think you're all that in a bag of chips and be feel beautiful with even if you gain those 10, 20 pounds or whatever it might happen or as you age because we're all aging, um, like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. Right? Yeah. And uh, I think that it's also worth saying before we just move off of this one, Wendy, is that men don't see us in terms of our beauty from the same critical eye. Men that consider us their type, they don't see us from the same critical eye that we often see ourselves. They don't necessarily look at us and say, oh, my word, she's got a little belly going. You know, they, they just look at you and see you as beautiful. You, I know you want to add something to this. I can feel it. <laughs> They're called love handles. They really are. <laughs> They're not called hate handles. Yeah. One of the most heartbreaking realizations after doing so much studying of men of this topic was I can't give every woman the knowledge I have about the vast difference between what happens in here and what happens with a man. You know, we'll nitpick and know that the relationship is not going to turn out because we're not attractive over five pounds. Mm -hmm. Men could go another 50. I have a very good friend who was married for 20 years and when she, and the whole time she told her husband she was fat. Right. And when they divorced and he remarried, he remarried somebody about 50 pounds heavier than her. And that it would have been, you know, she was hitting herself in the head that she, she wrecked, she wrecked any connection and intimacy and love and understanding his appreciation of her beauty because of her inner critic. You know, our inner critics will drive us nuts. 
our inner critics will compel us to say things about our weight or our age or how this isn't looking anymore or how our bodies have betrayed us. And men are sad for us. They, they know that, that there's a crazy lady feeding bad information in there and, and he doesn't know how to change our mind about that and we can rarely hear it. So if I could give you one gift, it would be to look at your beauty through a man's eyes instead of through your inner critic's eyes because they have so much more space for our humanity than we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and please, ladies, don't point out your flaws. <laughs> don't bring up your flaws to a man. If you're with a man who loves you and thinks you're beautiful, you don't need to be pointing out a new wrinkle or a new five pounds or a new whatever, you know, or a gray hair or whatever may be going on for you that's making you feel like your inner critic is coming forward. Please don't point that out to a man because chances are he's not even going to see it. If he sees you as beautiful, that's such a gift. And just enjoy that and bask in that and allow that to be. Um, you know, I feel like I know something really personally about this because as, as most of you know, I am a breast cancer survivor and uh, in 2012 I was diagnosed with a, a fairly advanced stage of breast cancer which required me to do the whole shebang. Had a double mastectomy, lost all my hair, went through radiation, had to go through all kinds of things to survive and I'm a grateful survivor. but. To say that I didn't feel very attractive would be an understatement. Oh, they also removed my ovaries and everything as part of the treatment. So I was losing everything in terms of my physical body that made me feel feminine. I mean, I was like going, what? I feel like, I feel like I'm losing not just potentially my life, but I felt like I was losing all of my femininity. But my husband would kiss my bald head and tell me how beautiful I was going through all of this. And what I got from that was that he saw me not just for my physical body, not just for all that I could accomplish or all that I could do or things that I thought were impressive about me. He saw the essence of me. He saw my soul. He still saw me as a beautiful feminine woman. Now, I know some of you who are single were saying, well, yeah, he already loved you, which is true. But I'm just giving you this as an example as to how much a man can really care for a woman and how he can see her beauty through things that seem like almost impossible. Um, and that was really touching to me. That really meant so much to me that I, I got that he loved me in such a way that he, he saw me as beautiful even in the midst of all of that. That was an amazing experience. A great gift. That was beautiful. Yeah. So, okay. So now, Wendy, um, I, I want to talk about something that um, I think is really important. And that is, you know, why sometimes men behave badly, why they might objectify a woman on the street. Um, just let's talk a little bit, just a little bit about some of the things that have come to light, you know, through the Me Too movement and how good men respond to that, and just a few things that um, might be valuable for the women to hear. We want to end this on a really positive note, but since this is a, a hot topic, I think it's good to touch on it. For sure I do, and before I even start anything, I just want to say I am not making excuses for men, and we're going to talk about how they behave, and this is uh, what I'm going to give you is what works and what doesn't, and the the why of it, but I'm not excusing it because any sort of hassling on the street and hey baby, give me a smile and all that bullshit we have to deal with is not cool. It's just not good. It's right. not okay. It's not good. Right. So I, I don't want to give anyone the idea that I'm going to talk about why men do this and now you have to coddle them over this. We're not, we're not doing that on the show today. So what I do want you to know is that a man who is going to objectify a woman on the street, what is going on? What is behind that? What, where the cogs are turning and the wheels are turning, what's happening is he feels objective. Uh, he feels, um, he objectifies when he feels, ah, 
emasculated. That's the word I'm looking for. So whether he was emasculated by his mother or by if he was emasculated by his community or his work or his wife or his whoever, women everywhere, he's feeling emasculated by women. And if he walks by you and you don't look at him at all, you don't even notice his presence, and you don't have to, by the way, you have the right to not look at people. If you ignore him, it's one more incident where he feels emasculated because his presence on the planet is so insignificant, he isn't even worth being seen. Men feel unseen and men feel invisible. And that automatic response, not like an excuse, the automatic response to emasculation is objectification. So in that moment, knee-jerk response to be a jerk to you. Or that he's just emasculated in the world and his knee-jerk response back to the world is objectification of you, to get a rise out of you, to make your day a little crappier, right? The catcalling is similar. The, it's, you're probably not going to find me attractive and I'm really disturbed by your beauty, so I'm going to make your day a little bit more uncomfortable. Now, this can be turned around and you don't have to, but you literally could change the experience you have on the street if you felt like it. Not telling you you have to, but if you wanted to, you could. Now, I want to tell you a quick story about a, a friend of mine. Her name is Lisa. Lisa lived in New York City, and Lisa would walk out of her front door apartment in New York City to head to the gym, and there was a construction site going on, and every day she'd get catcalled. Every day, every day, every day. She couldn't go the other way. Her gym was to the right. She had to go that way, and every day. And she dreaded leaving her house because she just didn't want to put up with it. And one day, she decided she was going to try something out. She was going to science experiment the sucker out. She walked out her front door, and before they could even see her, she said, Good morning, buenos dias, hello. They got all like, hello. <laughs> she came back from the gym, looking good, gotten pretty far with that paint job right there. Within two days... They were waving at her. The cat calling had stopped. If something bad happened on the street, there would have been 25 construction crew to have her back. She flipped them. And I'm not saying you have to be all friendly, hattie duty with everybody you see, but when I walk down the street, now I have the, I have the advantage of being large and older, so I don't have the problem that the supermodel has when she walks down the street, but we still have to deal with, you know, all women have to deal with the street, right? So it's a little easier for me than being a supermodel, but still I make a concerted effort every time I walk down the street and I'm not smiling, not necessarily smiling. I'm not always going to be all smiley at the people, but I'll walk down the street and just eye to eye. I see you. Sometimes I do the head nod, right? So if you walk down the street making eye contact with the people you see, and if you want to smile, smile. If you don't want to smile, do a head nod or just, just look at them like, I see you, human being over there. You literally will cut down on so much crap. So much crap. Mm -hmm. to, it's, the, it's the looking down or looking away or the scared little bunny that becomes prey. But I see you. Yeah, you're not prey anymore. You're not a mark anymore. You're not worth the objectification. So do what you want. It's your right to do whatever you want on the street. But if you want to play with this like a science experiment and see if you can have a different experience, try it out. Mm -hmm. And for the women, I know that there are really beautiful women in their 20s and 30s, and it is rough. It is rough for you. And I am so sorry for what you have to go through. And a lot of women actually can't relate to how intense it is for you. And I'm really sorry that that happens because I know that it's either pissing you off or scary, depending on what moment it is in your life in that moment. And I'm really sorry that, that the world is like that. 
And I promise you it will change. It will change somewhere around the age of 45 when you start to become a little more invisible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this is really important too to understand, again, we're not excusing any bad behavior from men at all because women, uh, Wendy and I are both advocates for women. We take a stand for our sisters out there. But I do think it's important to understand some of this a little bit deeper from some of the wounds that some of these men are carrying and that they feel invisible or emasculated. And you think about it in the world, men get very little in, unless they're in a relationship with a woman that knows how to really affirm him and appreciate him, men get very little of that from the world at large. Men, per se, live in what we might say is kind of a competitive environment when it comes to each other. They're not continually complimenting each other or acknowledging each other. You know, and if on a football field, they might pat each other on the back or say, hey, dude, or good job, dude, or whatever, high five. But for the most part, men get very little in terms of positive feedback. And I think so many of them really do feel invisible. And that's one of the reasons why I think throughout these man panels that I've run, and I'm sure, Wendy, this came up all of the time in the, win in the man panels that you um, were a part of as well, it's almost impossible to overemphasize acknowledging and appreciating a good man and um, how, how deep their need is for that. Absolutely. Yeah. And the thing is, is it's in our nature to not appreciate them very much because we think that if we appreciate them for every little thing, they're not going to do anything that there is a feeling amongst the sisterhood that if you appreciate the little things then he won't try for the big things, but that's actually untrue. What I've found in my research is men don't try harder from failure or from being left alone and not appreciated. They go away. And when they go away, they usually walk out saying something like you should be with someone who can make you happy. Mm -hmm. And we can be unhappy on principle because we think they'll try harder, but they have to win with you. They have to be able to know that they're appreciated and that the efforts that they make, make you happy. And if we don't let them know this, if we're waiting for the big wins before we really make an appreciation, if we keep them on appreciation diets, we're not going to get anywhere near what we could get in terms of love, affection, attention, gifts, everything everything that they're dying to give and provide, we're not going to get it if they don't feel appreciated. So it's one of the mismatches. And honestly, I can tell you, I've been coaching married couples for a really long time, really long time. And couples who have been married for more than 20 years almost inevitably have the same complaint. Now, every marriage has different issues and different flavors, but in almost every single one of them, he is upset because he feels unappreciated for what he provides and he needs her to be happy and she won't pony up happy because she doesn't feel like he appreciates everything she does. Mm -hmm. So she, she feels like she's doing everything and he feels like he's providing things without appreciation. And it's just, everybody has everybody on a starvation diet of appreciation and everybody's playing chicken. Who's going to go first? Yeah. Nobody, nobody wants to appreciate the other person. Yeah. That downward spiral to a long-term marriage. Yeah, and I really want to emphasize one thing you said here, Wendy, is that sometimes as women, we think if we appreciate the little things, he won't go for the big things. I thought that was so important that I just wanted to repeat it one more time. And we also think, well, why do I have to appreciate my partner for doing his part? I'm doing all this heavy lifting over here. And I just got to tell you, it's worth doing. If just from a workability standpoint, to get more, a little appreciation goes a long way. Yeah, in fact, um, uh, knowing that we were going to do this tonight, I asked my husband, uh, 
I said, if there was one thing you would want me to convey to the ladies, because the lady that my husband just loves the ladies in this audience and um, really wants to contribute. I said, if there was just one thing that I could share with the ladies tonight, what would that be? You know, from that, from that masculine point of view. And he said, um, when you're in the early stages of cultivating a relationship with a man, keep an eye out for things that are generally pleasing or valuable. In a warm and sincere way, express appreciation, gratitude, or thanks. So these can just be little things. And of course, this applies once you're into a relationship as well. But he says, specifically express, specifically make a point to express, acknowledge, and appreciate. And he said, few things warm the heart of a man more than when he knows that he's appreciated for what he does, when he feels warm and sincere gratitude, when he feels like what he does or has done for you has pleased or helped you. He said, men will either consciously or unconsciously be more drawn to you as a woman. So that just goes along with this. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I thought that was very sweet that that was his that was his share. And it's definitely something I've learned to be better at <laughs> in my now almost 12 years of marriage. This piece, I love this piece. And we've talked about this before, but I think it's so important about how there are so many men out there in the world that really want to make a woman safe, that are really looking out for women, that are really that really have women's best interest at heart. And uh, I know we may have talked about this before, but I think this is something that's not always obvious to a lot of women. So we talked about the construction workers and the bad behavior over here earlier. But um, I, I really want to um, kind of go into this because I just think this is so important for women to understand about men. Yeah, there was a study done. I'm, I really wish I could cite the study for you right now with the two men that put it together. Um, it was an East Coast study, if you want to Google it, where they interviewed the, a college campus of men, men in their prime, right, in the, in the whole filled with testosterone, more testosterone than they're going to have in their lifetimes, right? Um, at that time in their life, they were able to interview them and do some study to find out who of them could potentially be dangerous or have been dangerous when it comes to women and safety, whether it was an actual assault or what, right? So obviously, they weren't asking that specific to ask specific question because people would just lie about it, but they were able to ask questions in a health related way that they were able to get all the information they need to find out which men on campus were likely and who wasn't. The percentage of dangerous men on campus in these two campus studies, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men, the percentage of dangerous men who had either offended or would be likely to offend? 7%. 7%. That means 93% of men are safe, are protectors, are heroes. Now, 7%, when I led a workshop with the men and women, everyone in the room was horrified, but for different reasons. They were shocked but for different reasons. The women were shocked that that percentage was so low. And the men were shocked that that percentage was so high. Mm. Shocking. Now, we think this is an impossible statistic because the Me Too movement shows that almost every woman has been affected. And this is true. But have you noticed when Weinstein and everybody else that got busted when the, the, they started digging, it wasn't one woman that came forward. One guy, dozens and dozens and dozens of women who bothered to come forward or who were willing or able to come forward. So our perpetrators out there of bad behavior, they don't just hit once. Over and over and over, their numbers are high. So it's... It seems to us that all men are dangerous, but we need to shift to there are some dangerous men 
and the majority of them are not. And what's really heartbreaking is here you've got a provider, protector type, but when we look at him, we look at him like, what kind of predator are you going to be? But no, 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 I'm the protector. I would protect you. Really? Because you're all pretty dangerous. Well, if you're only, if you're looking at a sheepdog, a protector, and you're looking at a wolf, right? You got a wolf and a sheepdog. If you're looking at them side by side, they're going to look the same if you're only looking at their teeth. So as a woman in the world, it's your job to look beyond the teeth. And how you do that is you look for how are men protecting me right now? And it's one of my favorite games. I do it all the time. I live in downtown San Francisco where there's always opportunities for crap to happen. So I'm always looking around to see who's going to save me from that very strange person right there. It, it's a game you can play with yourself when you're jogging on the jogging path and a man's coming up behind. He might yell, coming up from behind. That's him alerting you to say, I'm a protector. I'm safe. I don't mean to scare you. Or when you're in an experience, let's say you're dating and your date starts acting badly, look around. Because chances are, if you're in a crowded room, there's probably a guy already watching you. He's probably already watching your table to see if he's going to need to come step in, but he's not going to step in too soon because he doesn't want to offend you because you know how to take care of yourself, but he's going to be there. He's ready. I have a friend, Angela, who was on a date and her date behaved very badly. And she knew to do this. She went to the, she excused herself, went to the restroom, grabbed a guy in the hallway and said, can you please come save me from my date? He's being a real jerk. Absolutely. He was on it. That's who most men are in the world. There are fierce protectors, even when they're total strangers to you. I know personally that when I walk into a sushi restaurant, I can just scan the room. There's 11 guys in here. Okay, probably out of the 11, nine of them would save my butt if something happened. One might be on his cell phone. The other might be dealing with a wife and baby. That's my world that I get to walk around in. And I want that to be your world that you get to walk around in too. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. but, but you have to trust that they are out there and they're looking for the opportunity. And I just want to tell one very quick story about my partner, Dave. And he's an average, I think he's amazing. He's an average guy. Guys are like this, okay? So when I was living in Oakland and, and we were at a gas station, uh, he was hanging out at the gas station after we got our gas. And I'm like, let's go. And he said, hold on. Okay, I'll hold on. And he's just watching. I said, what you watching? He said, hold on. Waited, 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 waited. What was happening is what normally happens at the gas station in Oakland is we call it the hustle, right? The guy comes over with, the, he's going to do your windshield when you don't want him to do your windshield. And he's going to try and ask you for spare change and all that. And it's super annoying. And everybody knows in Oakland, the cops aren't coming. So you can pretty much do anything and the cops aren't coming. So <laughs> it's just the Oakland hustle. So he was watching the Oakland hustle and he watched the woman get her gas and he watched till, all the way till she got in her car and until she drove away. He didn't know that lady and she did not know he was watching her. In fact, he would be mortified to know that she caught him watching her, but he had her back and she didn't even know it. He was ready to step in and save the day, but he was respecting her enough to not try and get in there and make eye contact and be the, some weird guy. He didn't want to be the creepy guy. So you have men in your life every single day watching you to make sure you're good and they're total strangers and that's who men are. I want you to come live in my world and yeah, keep your eyes up for the ones that aren't great. They're out there too, but there's a whole lot of protectors out there. Yeah. I think that's so beautiful and so important for us to remember. And I think if we look for that, we can have that experience. Yes. For women, safety is always paramount. And it's important to be aware, to have your eyes open, and to not put yourself intentionally into situations that could be dangerous, 
terms of meeting new men or in terms of, you know, situations walking down a dark street at the wrong part of town at night or whatever. But that having been said, there are so many men out there. And like you said, Wendy, even strangers who would be willing to protect you, who would be willing to, you know, go out of their way to make sure that you were safe. I know my husband is one of those kinds of men. Your partner, Dave, is one of those kinds of men. I've had the blessing, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, of knowing and having a lot of really great men of that kind, of that ilk in my world. And I feel like it's so such a blessing. And uh, it's, it's interesting to me that you're sharing also the statistics were so shocking to both the men and the women for those different reasons. The women that it was so low, the men that it was so high. But I feel like we can uh, feel better about men in general and have better experiences with them in our day-to-day -day lives if we understand this about the vast majority of men out there. I just think it's really important. So thank you so much for sharing that one. I love that piece. Thank you. Yeah. So you want to take a few questions, Wendy? Should we take yeah. a few questions? Yeah, do it. Yeah. I really want to have you field this one because you are the queen of first dates. <laughs> <laughs> As I mentioned to you earlier, Wendy, I was more of a serial monogamist when I was dating. I would get into long-term relationships, even stay way past their due date. Um, stay way longer in a relationship that wasn't working out or that I knew probably wasn't going to work out. But my, my dear friend Wendy here, the queen of uh, first dates. So I think she's the perfect one for this question. So this is from Ruthie. She says, hi, Michelle. For some reason, even though I think I've been looking pretty hot and being present and interested and being my authentic self, I'm not getting second dates. Not sure if it's me or the guys, but it keeps happening. I suppose it's me. Any suggestions? This is from Ruthie. What would you say to her? <laughs> Ruthie, I wish I could come on a date with you so I could give you real powerful feedback. <laughs> but me too. Me too. <laughs> just, just guessing, uh, I'm going to just give you a couple of things to try because I'm not going to guess what you're doing or what he's doing or what, how you're picking. I, I can't do that. So one thing to try is to... And I know this sounds like it wouldn't get you any further, but listen more. I know you said that you are being interesting and interested, but what you can try on is listening to him. And then when he stops talking, just hanging out and listening about 20 to 30 seconds longer to see if there's more. And what I have noticed when in all of my years of dating is, and you can tell I'm a talker, right? I can do plenty of talking for hours and hours on end. And there were dates where I did plenty of listening for hours and hours on end. And there were dates where I had a combination of both. But I can say that I never regretted listening too much. And there were plenty of times that I regretted talking too much. And when we're talking all the time, one of the things that we do is we try and impress them, right? We're trying to impress them. They're trying to impress us. And really, we're trying to attract them. And how we're trying to attract them is through impressing them that they're trying to impress us. It's the mating dating thing. But when we try and impress them, oftentimes we can seem really dynamic and exciting and it's wonderful. But what's really juicy and magnetic and have, has them come back for more is when we have that depth of listening, of holding space for them and hearing them. And if during the times where I did more listening that I never regretted. <laughs> Usually I got way more information about him than I ever thought I could, which was great for sorting, right? Plus he seemed to think that when I was listening the whole time that I was an amazing conversationalist and definitely magnetic and worth another date. So mm -hmm. There's that, you know, there's another thing that happens that I hear a lot from both men and women. And what that is, is I'll hear a, a woman say, he talked and talked and talked the whole time. And then a man will say, she grilled me all evening. I think that's the same date. So, so you just be in the space of 
instead of having maybe your whole list of questions to ask, if you use a list, you know, if the list that's in here that will help sort, instead ask more positive and open-ended questions that can have him go deep if he wants to. And you could ask questions like, what do you love about your life? Or what's coming up this summer that you're really looking forward to? Or what works about your life? And then just sit back and be the most magnetic conversationalist ever by not saying hardly anything at all. See if that makes a difference. Just try it out. Yeah, a couple of things that came up for me from things you mentioned there, too, Wendy, is that I think sometimes as women, because especially maybe as we get a little older uh, or because we have um, we have felt like uh, we've been in relationships where we might have invested too much time and we don't want to waste time, we have this dialogue going on in our heads when we're on a date. We're looking across from a man and he's still trying to decide what even to get to eat or whatever. And we're thinking, is he my guy? Do I like him? Does he like me? Am I his type? Is he my type? Is there attraction here, etc.? In other words, we have such a dialogue going on that it can be difficult to just be present. And so even though Ruthie is saying, you know, I'm looking good and I'm being authentic and that sort of thing, I'm just kind of wondering if there might be a little bit too much thinking going on rather than just being there and enjoying the date for whatever, what, whatever it is, for whatever it is. I have one more thing to say about this. So Ruthie, if you're showing up present and you – your authentic you, and you're not getting that second date. Our job is to show up as ourself, to represent ourselves as best we can, which can be harder than it seems. <laughs> to be authentic, right? And whatever happens, if you showed up as you, like the best you you could, if you showed, showed up as you, you did your job. You did your dating job, and that's it. And if he doesn't call back, he wasn't the right one for you. He wasn't your guy because your guy, he calls back. Yeah. 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 And in fact, there's some huge advantages to fast sorting. And we might call this a form of sorting because you're not investing, you know, if they're not asking you out again, you're obviously not investing your time there either. And you don't get stuck in those, you know, five year relationships like I did that are the wrong relationship. And you're five years later by the time you unravel all of that. So some advantages there too. Yeah. So someone um, says here, uh, she didn't put her name. It just says uh, a um, in the man panel, the dating site match.com was recommended. My question is, isn't eHarmony preferable because they take psycho psychology and matching seriously. If Wendy and I are both saying no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> they take that seriously for marketing purposes. Right. It, it doesn't do you any better to use eHarmony. And in fact, eHarmony is the only site that I don't like. And I have nothing against the company. I think that they're great people. They mean well. And they cause all these extra hoops for you to jump through. And it wastes your time. And one of the things that Michelle and I want for you is we want you to be able to move through the dating experience lightly tethered to the earth, just lightly, you're not sucked down in the quicksand of the dating minutia and the awfulness that can sometimes happen with getting in these circles and traps and back and forth and the things that burn us out. So we want you lightly tethered so you're not burned out on the experience because you got dredged down in the mud, right? But we don't want you, so we want you lightly tethered to the earth. We don't want you so flighty that there's no substance to you. We want you to have substance, right? You want that. We want that for you. So we want you to have a real dating experience that isn't surface, that isn't all fluff, but that you're not sucked down into the dredges of it. And that's what eHarmony does. It causes you to jump through hoops that you don't need to jump through that really doesn't create any more compatibility. It has you do all these things to get to each other that don't make any sense. We want you, you believe it or not, I like Tinder. What? I do. I like the apps because they will get you off the couch and get you in front of them face to face. Now, I, I do like the substance of a match or an OkCupid okay or 
the over 50 sites and all the other sites. J-Date, I love them all, right? The only one I don't like is eHarmony because of the hoops. But seriously, you want to be able to call this online connecting, meet them right away if you like them at all, and so you can turn it into something real instead of this back and forth business that happens with eHarmony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add to that except that in my experience in working with my clients, I have not had my clients have success with eHarmony. And one time I did ask my husband about it and he said, I can tell you right now, as a man, I would never go through answering all those questions to get on there. He said, I just wouldn't do it. He said, I, I wouldn't take the time to do that. That would be too laborious for me. So for whatever that's worth, that's our take on that. And uh, I agree with Wendy. It's a marketing thing and it seems like there might be something to it just when you hear about their algorithms and how they're supposedly matching people. But um, I haven't had clients have success with it. I've had, I've had people married from every site, including Tinder. Yeah. Okay, let's see. We have Lynn here. She's coming back to where we talked about, uh, Wendy, where we talked about how attraction can grow for, for women, but doesn't mm -hmm. typically happen for men. Mm -hmm. um, she says, how many dates to know if you have enough chemistry? Assume from a start of some attraction on date one, but if it doesn't grow after three to five dates, I'm thinking it's not going to opinions. Okay, great. Thank you for asking. I hate rules, so you want to play it person by person by person. But if we're going to give you a, a guideline, a, something to work with here, three dates, at, at least three dates. Now, w before I say three dates, if on that first date you are repulsed or you're looking at this guy going, he and I do not have enough material to go longer than three weeks, then don't bother. But if He's just not quite your type. He's maybe a little shorter than you like, a little balder than you'd like, a little something not quite right. But you like him. He's funny. He brings out the best in you. You respect him. You wish you were attracted. That's the guy that you give a chance to. That's the guy you give a couple of dates to. And in fact, I had the experience of seeing someone on match and oh, I was so excited about him because he was different than everybody else. And I loved his profile and I knew this could be the one, right? And we got on the date and right when I saw him, I didn't like him. I didn't like him. Mm -hmm. And I was so bummed out because he looked so good on paper, just so good on paper, but it was dinner. So I was stuck. All right, whatever. And we ended up having a really mediocre dinner, but then we went on a little urban hike and had this really great little date that I thought at the end of, oh, I'd be friends with him. He actually is the guy in the profile, but just not my flavor. Mm -hmm. And by and I just said yes, because I was bored for the second date. And by the end of the third date, we were, it was three in the morning. We were sitting in his car in front of my parking garage where my car was, and we couldn't leave each other. I flipped. It it flipped. And Michelle talked about it earlier. It doesn't happen very often, but about 20, 30 percent of the time. They can grow on us, um, but you got to give them enough of a chance. So three, four, or five dates, if it's been a couple of months. And the one thing you have to be really careful about is if you're trying to give him a chance and he's not growing on you, you got to be honest with yourself because what will happen is you'll be talking to your girlfriends about it and they'll get really excited for you and they'll say, oh, God, finally a great guy. He's treating you like a queen. And then this guy starts to fall in love with you. And then all of a sudden, it's three months later or five years later, and you've been with somebody who he never grew on you, but the pressure that you felt from your girlfriends and from his attraction for you, the pressure was too intense that it was really hard to break up. I know a woman who married a man because she didn't know how to break up. But mm -hmm. never yeah, and a couple of things I just want to add to this piece. Uh, we obviously, Wendy and I want you to have attraction. Attraction is absolutely important. And having that physical attraction is important to women and it's important to men. It's just that it sometimes develops differently as we talked about earlier. However, this is the point I wanted to emphasize. We have to be careful with attraction because I can tell you 
the man I was most attracted to in all of my decades of dating was an absolute mismatch for me. I mean, we were a complete and total disaster together. It was a nightmare. But I'll tell you what, when this man kissed me, my toes would curl. I felt like I was going to faint. I mean, my attraction to him, and he was totally different from, my attraction to him was off the charts. He was totally different than any man I'd ever dated. He was literally like the tall, dark, handsome bad boy. And that was totally not the type of guy that I'd ever gone for before. But I'm telling you, the attraction, I was just, it was overwhelming. However, together, you know, when we, when we dated and as we started going into a relationship, it was a nightmare. We were just terrible for each other. We were so mismatched. So we have to be careful with attraction and not make that the end all be all only criteria that we're looking at. Yes, it's important. But what I've found for myself and for most of my clients is things that start out more like that slow burn and then turn into the forest fire rather than starting out as the forest fire are a lot more likely to go the distance. Because I can just tell you that was just a nightmare. And I had a terrible time unraveling myself from it because I was so like addicted to him from a, you know, from an attraction standpoint, I, I just found him so irresistible, even though it was a complete nightmare um, in every other way. <laughs> I'm smiling so hard because it's true that chemistry and attraction doesn't have anything to do with a happy life. And I was smiling so hard because I have had, and it's just embarrassing to say it, but I have had a 30 year plus attraction for someone who is probably one of the worst human beings I know on the planet. He's just such a <laughs> jerk. <laughs> He's not a good person in the world. And I just think that my body is betraying me every single time I see him and get Twitterpated. And I just, I get Twitterpated and then I immediately I'm grossed out. I've grossed myself out. <laughs> but I just to piggyback on what you said, my, my chemistry for my, my partner is really strong. So when I met him, it was really, really strong. But the reason it worked is because we had chemistry and compatibility. And the piece that you always have to watch for is, can I be myself with him? You know, I had such high chemistry for my partner, Dave, that when I met him, I thought, at first glance, I thought, oh, I'm screwed. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to be myself with him. And I'm never going to be able to hold a boundary with this one. He's so hot. But there was something in that we had a very short sort of meet and greet date. There was something about who he was being in that first date that was so easy breezy that he was so curious and interested in who I was. And it was totally fine to be exactly who I was. If I was a hot mess, it was fine to be a hot mess. He was, he was there. He had the space, the capacity to hold it all. Who are you, you interesting, weird person? And I was in, I was like, okay, we're doing this. So it, so to be able to say, we're doing this, we're having this date and I'm going to be exactly who I am. And I'm going to tell a really bad story that you probably shouldn't tell on a first date. And, and I'll laugh too loud and do all the things. If he's the right person for you, who can hold the space for it, it it's all going to turn out. Mm -hmm. if, he's not, if he's not, he's not right. Yeah. So attraction can be there, but you absolutely have to be able to have it be easy and be yourself also. And that can be the real tricky part. Yeah, and I think the danger about this, uh, to use that word, um, is if we put so much emphasis on attraction that that is kind of like what we're looking for because it can be really intoxicating and really exciting, is it can also cause us to overlook major red flags. Like with this guy that I told you about that I was so attracted to, Mm -hmm. I overlooked so many big red flags that it wasn't even funny. And a lot of times when I'll ask women um, that I'm talking to about uh, relationships that have ended in heartbreak or pain or that sort of thing, oftentimes they have started out with that really magnetic attraction. And, and I'll sometimes ask them, you know, were there early warning signs that some of this might be coming down the pike? 
And in almost every case, they'll say, yes, you know, but the attraction was so strong or I liked this, how I felt so much that I kind of, you know, ignored those. I even had one lady say, uh, yeah, there were more red flags than in the Chinese Communist Parade, which I thought <laughs> was a pretty w funny way to say it. Yeah. So that's, you know, of course, attraction is important. You know, we want that for you. And we know you want that. It's important to women as it is for men. But uh, we just have to kind of be careful with that. Okay, let's see, Wendy. Let's see if we can. Uh, How's the light? Is it okay? My light changed. So. Oh, yeah. Not, right. It's all right. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, I know we're live, but I'm just checking on the light for the people. <laughs> okay. okay. This is a funny question. Yeah. Uh, KH, two dates with a very nice man, easy conversation, polite, interesting, but uh oh, sloppy, icky kisser. <laughs> How to deal with that, please? <laughs> yeah. So, are you willing to be as vulnerable as to be honest about that? I mean, it might be the next kiss, or it might be, you know, another date or two later where you say, hey, um, can I tell you how I like to kiss? Can I show you how I like to kiss? Instead of saying you're a bad kisser, I would make it about me. Here's how I like it instead of you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I wish I would have known this earlier in my life because I remember this man I dated in college and I really, really liked him. But when he kissed me, it was like he would press so hard. It felt like he was going to push my teeth out. You know, he would just push so hard. He was like a really hard kisser. And I didn't enjoy it at all. And I didn't know what to do with that. You know, I mean, it's, I'm like 18, 19 years old at this point. And it was definitely one of the reasons why I didn't, you know, continue dating him because it was just so awkward. It was just, it was yucky kissing. So yeah. I, I love that. I love that approach, Wendy. That was beautiful. And if you can slip a little compliment in there ahead of time without being disingenuous, please do. Like, I really love spending time with you. And can I show you something that I like even better or something like that? So it's so how, where you're coming from is you're winning with me and let's make it even better instead of we need to fix this problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if we could squeeze in a couple more questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, how can you tell if a man is lying? Hmm. That's an interesting question. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I went on 121 first dates and I met a lot of guys that I never met in real life by just writing back and forth for a minute or doing the things. And rarely did I ever get lied to. Now, is that the truth? But here's the thing. I decided that people don't lie to me and I just don't grant that being. I mean, if they do, all right, I missed it. Cool. And if I find out that I'm going to not hang out with them anymore, or I'm going to have a conversation with them about it. And it's not something that I really spend a lot of time thinking about because what I notice is we'll tell ourselves stories and that's what shows up. I only attract liars or I only attract weirdos or I only attract the cheaters. Watch what you're telling yourself. Mm -hmm. So if, if you are focused and afraid that that's who you're going to attract universe is going to be like, cool, I can serve that up all day long. But you know what? It just never really hit my radar as a problem because I just wasn't willing to let it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, also, I also know that if I'm a safe place to say anything, if, if people lie, a human animal in us, we, both men and women, we lie. If we get backed into a corner and our life feels threatened and we can't figure out a faster way out, we'll lie. And an honest person will tell you when they lied. Dave and I do it all the time. Not all the time, I mean literally in five years of being together. There's been like four times where I've had to say, hey, so I lied about a thing. <laughs> Let me clean it up. Here's what I lied about. And here's, I lied because I was afraid of this thing, right? So an honest person will tell you when they lied. So if you don't create the environment where they feel backed into a corner, chances are they're not going to lie to you anyway. Mm -hmm. Why would they bother? Yeah. And I really do believe in the idea that you're talking about, uh, about 
we create so much of our own experience by our own beliefs. And so if you believe that all men are liars or all men are cheaters or all men are unable to commit or all men want is sex or whatever the belief might be, that is likely going to be your experience because we we form beliefs in our minds and then we find evidence to support those beliefs and then we develop a confirmation bias around that. We find evidence that backs up that initial belief which may have been false to begin with, but we collect evidence for it and that becomes our experience. And so um, sometimes, and I'm just going to throw this out, sometimes asking different or more powerful questions instead of asking uh, how can I tell if a man is lying? Um, what if you ask yourself a question like, uh, what if I believed that men out there were dealing with me in good faith? I mean, if you switch your questions, what I'm saying is, if you, we're looking for answers, but, if, but sometimes the key to the answers is flipping your questions into something more positive. Or what if I really knew that most of the men out there really do desire to deal with a woman in good faith and are really those providers and protectors that we talked about. Just saying, yep. you, can flip your, you can flip your experience to some extent by flipping your questions and, and questioning, asking different questions that are in a more positive light. Like one of my clients recently asked me, well, what if I never find anybody? What if I never meet the right guy? Well, so what's the belief under that? There's beliefs going on underneath that. There are beliefs that there's a shortage of men or that, you know, whatever, something about her, she might believe something about her that she's not going to attract the kind of man she wants or whatever. And so I said, let me ask you this question. I said, what if you were to ask yourself this question? If you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that your right guy is out there and that you're going to meet him and that that's inevitable, how would you be? What would change for you? And we were totally able to flip this in her way of thinking. And she came away feeling so energized and excited and full of the possibility. So I just want to offer this as, you know, kind of a little side note to this question. Yeah, that's really great. And when you have a really clean and clear vision that men are pretty good guys out there for the most part and that they're not you know that they're coming at you with good faith how what happened because that's how I did it what happens is when you're dating all you get to see now is oh we're not a fit okay next we might be a fit let's date some more and find out more about this one that one over there oh yeah we're not a fit so instead of he's a bad guy or he, I found out he lied or no, it's just, are we a fit? Are we not a fit? Maybe let's see. Maybe we are a fit. Don't know yet. It's pretty great. Yeah. Yeah, it is pretty great. Okay. I think we're kind of coming up to the end of our time and uh, I want to take one last question, Wendy, just to kind of wrap up. Okay. And uh, I want to thank everybody for your presence here. And I want to thank my dear friend and my wonderful colleague, Wendy Newman. Uh, you're so generous with your time and with your wisdom. And I really appreciate you. So thank you so much. Me too. For thank you for having me back. I love playing with you, Michelle. Let's wrap up with one last question. Um, let's see. I'm a divorced 47-year-old woman who recently started dating a 42-year-old man who is never married. It seems like he's the type of man that Wendy talked about who wants to build his castle first. My question is, how do I ask his intentions for a long-term relationship without coming across too strong? I don't want to wait too long for fear of becoming attached and, and investing too much of my time. This is a great question, and I have some thoughts, but I'll let you go first. Oh, no, go first. Go ahead. Well, I, first of all, I want to say um, great job for uh, being out there dating. And I want you to know I actually married a man five years younger than I am. Uh, my husband is five years younger than I am. So I think, uh, you know, when we get to a, a, a mature age, 40s and beyond, I just don't think age is like that big of a thing. So that's one thing. 
Um, the fact that he's um, never been married, um, I, I know that this can be sometimes an obstacle for some women because some women kind of think, well, you know, he's never been married. What's the problem here? Or is he going to be the kind of man that's able to commit? But I can tell you, like, my husband and I, when we got married, he was 38. I was 43. Um, and my husband was, it took him a while to kind of figure out his career path. Um, you know, he became, a, he, he got his master's in accounting and then worked for a few years and then decided he wanted to go back to law school. So he went to law school in his mid thirties, didn't graduate from law school till later in his thirties. And he wanted to kind of have his career in place before he really felt like he was ready for marriage. So this whole castle building thing that you brought up can be a real thing for some men. And it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, that he's not ready. A lot of times, this is what I'll say, a lot of times men will share with you in things they say or in conversation, kind of the direction or vision that they have for their lives, for their future, what they want. A lot of times men tell us things and we don't always hear them or we don't always listen or we don't always believe them, right? But my husband would say things like, you know, if I'm fortunate enough to get married in the next few years, you know, I would really like to, whatever. You know, he would mention and he would say things like that. I also think it's fine as you're, you know, exploring and getting to know someone to just kind of not come out and say, so what are your intentions? Or so do you see, you, do you see yourself marrying me? No, that's not what we're talking about. But I think it's okay to just kind of say, um, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, what's working in your life and where you see yourself five years from now, you know, just see, just explore, see what comes up in conversation. I just think a lot of times we miss the cues or we don't hear the cues. And a lot of times men tell us exactly where they're at. I'll let yeah. you take from there. Absolutely. I mean, you said a lot of it and if you play the game, what do you love about your life? Or what would you change about the way your life is now? If you had it all your way is a really great question. If you had it all your way, what's your life going to be like? What's it going to be like now? What's it, do you have any plans? About the whole life, right? So I, I don't want women asking the question on the first date ever. <laughs> and the, what's your intention with me is... I think often none of our business during the time we want to ask it because he's still trying to figure that out himself. But I would be more interested in what's his intention and direction for his own life. So you can see if you'd be included in that, mm -hmm. right? If you're on track for that. Now, what I did, I was in a very different situation because I had been single for over a decade and, um, I didn't have anything to clean up or handle or anything like that. And when I met Dave, I was his first date in 24 years. He was in a 24 year marriage. I was date number one. So <laughs> he was a brand newly divorced guy. Yeah. So instead of saying, what's your intentions? Like, can you imagine if I said to him, what's your intentions with me? He would have been out the door. <laughs> if I would have said, are you, are you, are you dating for a relationship? Ah, right. And, and he didn't intend to have one at that moment. He thought he was going to have some fun, but then he met me. So sometimes when you meet the right person for you, things will change. Or when you're at the right stage in your life, things will change. So what I said in my circumstance was, Hey, look, so I, I don't have anything to sort out, but you do. And because I don't have anything to sort out. I'm just going to let you lead this relationship. And what I need you to know is I don't need marriage, but I do need partnership. And if you can ever see while we're dating that we're not on track to be in a committed lifetime partnership, you need to let me know so we can stop dating. Mm -hmm. And giving him that space to lead was all he needed. Mm -hmm. All he needed. Yeah, it was, it was on after that. <laughs> so you want to if he's in a space, so for everybody, if he's in a space where he's still sorting out his life or uncertain of his, of his direction, that's not the time to lean in and say, where is this going with me? 
mm-hmm. you can do is you can state your intentions, tell him the path you're walking, let him lead. And if, you know, if you need to get off the path, get off the path. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I will say ultimatums never work. Though it's not a good idea. Don't give a man an ultimatum. But you do have the right as a woman to decide what's right for you and what your path is and to honor that and to express what you want. I mean, a big key to all of this is just, you know, you don't have to put that particular man on the spot, especially in the early stages, but you can let a man know what it is that you want. Like you said, Wendy, you you shared what it is that you wanted for yourself and for your life. Mm-hmm. And you weren't you weren't making any demands, you weren't giving any ultimatum, you were creating that space, but you were letting him know that that was what you wanted for yourself and for your life and asked if he didn't see it going in that direction that he would let you go. I think sometimes we're so afraid of speaking our truth, like because we're so afraid that it might scare someone off. But in almost every case, it's better to know earlier rather than later if that is going to be the case. And so just being able to speak from our hearts from what's true, speak what's true for us is a really powerful thing. Yeah, and not on the first date. Yeah, not on the first date. First date is, do I like you and do I want to see you again? It's exactly. not where, where is this going. Exactly. <laughs> if possible, turn off the chatterbox on that first date. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been so much fun. I know we could talk forever. Wendy and I are both talkers, you can probably tell. Thank you to all of you who've hung with us. Thank you again, Wendy, for your generosity and for your time. Thanks for having me, Michelle. And thank you, everybody, for hanging with us and, and spending your day with us. We really appreciate your time. Wendy and I are sending you lots of love and wishing you all the best. Bye-bye for now.